Amen. Amen. So great to be back together again this week. And uh, this is part of our worship. Uh, this is the part where we uh, take God's word uh, and open it together. And uh, God is worshiped in the proclamation of his word. God is worshiped in the response of the hearers. So let's continue to uh, worship the Lord together and open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Uh, uh, last time we were together, we studied uh, uh, Jesus Christ, the Word of God, receive Him. And uh, the message today, uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, recognize Him, recognize Him. And uh, if you have your Bible open to John chapter 1, I want you to know that I don't uh, make this stuff up. Look in uh, John 1, 14, see where it says there in the middle of uh, verse 14, we have seen. Verse 18 says, no one has ever seen. Uh, also, uh, if you uh, just look across the page, you'll see uh, that it says in verse 29, he saw Jesus. And then in verse 31, he might be revealed uh, to us. And then in verse 34, uh, I have seen, okay? So clearly there's something here that's supposed to be seen. And uh, uh, the person that's supposed to be seen is not the author, John. It's not even uh, necessarily one of the people here, John the Baptist. Uh, the one who is uh, supposed to be seen uh, is Jesus Christ, the one we were just singing about, the light of the world. Now, uh, let me just say before we pray, I hope you know this. Uh, if you don't, I am excited for you to learn this, that there is a kind of seeing that is not a seeing with your eyes. Amen. Do you understand that the most important seeing has absolutely nothing to do with those two circles there at the bottom of your forehead? Amen. There is a kind of seeing, I'll say again, that has a nothing to do with your eyes. And when he says here, we have seen, we have seen, we have seen, he's not talking about uh, visualizing something. He's talking about recognizing something, all right? And uh, the goal of this message is that we would go beyond simply understanding factual information about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that we'd actually come to a deeper seeing, and this is the goal uh, in John's writing, that we would see Jesus Christ for who he really is, and uh, that we would recognize uh, him. Now, uh, you have to know that I know uh, that I can't uh, create that effect. And we're uh, uh, being joined in worship now by all of our campuses, our new campus on the North Shore and at Niles and at Chicago North and in Elgin and Aurora and out in Crystal Lake. And uh, you have God's word, I hope, in your hands. But uh, let me just confess and make it clear that I uh, cannot, I don't have the ability uh, nor, none of us, I can't make you see anything. God has to open your eyes to a deeper understanding of the authentic Jesus. And, uh, and you have to want that. Okay? God's not going to press past your will. He's not going to throw you down. You have to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You have to want that. Turn to your neighbor and say you have to want it. All right? And, and I can't give you that, but you could express that right now. And I have uh, Andy here and said, I'm just going to bow here in prayer. And Andy's going to lead us in something that uh, this is the prayer. This is the prayer for this message. It's your saying, I want to recognize, I want to go past the seeing and understanding. So let's, let's all pray together. Open the eyes of my heart. Sing it. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see I want to see you. Last time, everyone pray. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Yes, 
I want to see you. Yes, Lord, yes. In Jesus' name, say it. Amen. Amen. All right. So I believe God is helping us now. He knows how to give good gifts to his children. So um, I jot this down. There's going to be four truths about Jesus uh, Christ today that we want to see uh, right out of the Gospel of John. Four truths that I've seen. I, wanna, I want you to see. I want to see afresh. And then um, kind of an implication or an application for each one. You tracking with me? Here's the first uh, truth about Jesus Christ. Jot it down. Jesus is full of grace and truth. That's who he is. He's full of grace and truth. Uh, last week uh, at church, um, unbelievable, last weekend at church, we had uh, 20,590 people uh, in worship here. And, and uh, awesome, uh, like, like obliterating the previous attendance record by I think 2,000 or something. And so God's alive and well at harvest, uh, working, and I praise him for that, and I know that you do. Uh, these uh, are, um, wow, 254 decision cards, each one individually filled out by a person making the decision to follow Jesus Christ personally. Let's welcome them again into our... Amen. Amen. And Everyone, an amazing story. I'll, I'll tell you some of the stories over the next few weeks, I'm sure. Just incredible stories uh, coming in of, of God at work uh, in our church, and I praise him for that. But you think about uh, each one of those decisions, uh, you might uh, find yourself um, asking the question, um, how, how does that happen exactly? I mean, how, how does it happen that a person comes into a church or sits in a coffee shop or sits in your living room and hears the gospel and then they, when, when, when many people would say, not for me, I don't want that. How many people have had somebody tell you at some point, I don't want that? But so, so, so how does it happen when a person's like, I, I do want that. I want it right, I'm going to walk to the front of that church, I'm going to pray, I'm going to get, I want this. How does that happen? It's right here, look at verse 13. We ended last time at verse 12, all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. How does that happen? And all God's people said, verse 13, here's how it happens, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How, how many people uh, here, and do this, follow me on all of our campuses, how, how many people here had, uh, had parents? <laughs> okay, that's good. You're like, so, somebody's saying, dude, if you don't have parents, man, you can't even be alive. Don't you know that? I do, actually. I do, actually. Did you know you can't be alive physically, of course, without physical parents? And you can't be alive spiritually without a spiritual parent. God is the spiritual parent. And that's what he's saying here when he says, well, how, how did those, how did, here's how they were born. Of course, born there is not talking about born physically. It's talking about born spiritually. How, how do you get into a child of God? See, the right to be called children of God. It implies a family. Every family has a father. How do you get into the family? How do you get God as your father? Well, you have to be born. We're going to learn about it in chapter 3 again. You have to be born spiritually. And just to make that really clear, he's like, that doesn't happen from blood, okay? So I think what that means is it doesn't happen from physical parents, or maybe it is even a, a more graphic reference to the uh, birth process itself. It's not a physical birth is what he's saying. It's not of blood. Look at the text. Nor of the will of the flesh. Your human parents can't cause you to be born spiritually. Your own physical self, you can't pull yourself up and save yourself. You can't make it happen from the will of the flesh. And then the last thing, nor of the will of man. So my mom can't do it for me. I can't do it for myself. And you can't do it for me either, okay? It's, it's just you responding and receiving what God the Father offers. Salvation is of the Lord. It's just good to be reminded of that. And God wanted us to be reminded of it because here it is in John 1, 13. Salvation is of the Lord. Everyone say it. 
Salvation is of the Lord. All right, that's verse 13. And then he says, speaking of Jesus, he says, and the Word became flesh. Remember back in verse 1, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We studied that last time. Just a little bit more on this phrase, the Word. I just wanted to acknowledge, it might be in some of your study Bibles if you have them, uh, this idea of referring to God as the Word was not original with John. Uh, the Greeks and the Stoics uh, used the concept of the Word, and what they meant was uh, uh, six centuries before Christ, people were referring to God unknown as the Word. And uh, they described this being that created everything as the rational principle by which everything exists. Even in the sixth century before Christ, they could see that there was a, an order in the universe and that the planets and the stars were moving in a galactic choreography that staggers the mind. And as creation was shouting, there's a God, there's a God, there's a God, they were like, for sure there is. And they called that God, even though they didn't know who or what it was, they called it the Word, okay? And so the source of order in the universe, the, rational, the rationality behind uniformity, they called it the Word, the Greeks, the Stoics, the Jews, to the Jews, the word, word, that was the word of God, that the word was the revelation that came out from God. They had the Old Testament, and so the word meant God's revelation of himself. And so it is brilliant that John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, wasn't coining some new term. They knew there was a word, they, and he's like, the word's Jesus. And, and so because we don't have all that history, it doesn't just kind of click like that uh, for us. Hopefully that makes it even clearer to you when he says in verse 14, and the Word, the revelation of God, the rational principle by which everything exists, it's Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now again, look up here. I got to just give you a little background. Um, they would have been like, <gasps> because Plato had taught that if there was a, a, a rational a being uh, responsible for the existence of the universe, he was um, unknowable. He was uh, distant and removed and unknowable. If there was a word, and Plato used this concept to the word, if there was a word, he was, uh, under all circumstances, um, un unreachable and unknowable. So... I mean, isn't, isn't Christianity revolutionary? Because re Christianity steps in and says, oh yeah, there's a word, all right. Not unreasonable, not unknowable, certainly the source of all rational thought and the created owner in the universe, his name is Jesus. Jesus Christ is the word of God who became flesh. That's the good news of the gospel, that God didn't leave us in our sin, but God came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. became flesh and dwelt among us. And notice there, there's the first, we have seen. Have you seen it? He means certainly we saw Jesus, we were eyewitness accounts, but he means more than that. We saw and we recognized his glory. You know what glory is? I've taught this a lot of times, I won't go over it. Glory is God's fingerprint. Glory is God's signature. Glory is anything in the universe that, that, that indicates that there's a God. Okay, whether it's a beautiful mountainscape or the stars at night or the human eye or, or, or just anything that you know couldn't have got here by itself, all of that is shouting glory. Now here's what he says about Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We, we saw, we beheld his glory. And then it says in this uh, translation, glory as of the only son from the father. Now. What do you suppose the glory of Jesus was? Imagine yourself for a moment uh, walking with Jesus, sitting and talking with him. Imagine if you get to spend an hour uh, today at, uh, at uh, 8 p.m., you get an hour alone with Jesus. What do you think will be his most outstanding characteristic? I would have thought that he would have said that his glory is his, I, I think he would, how many people think Jesus would be very loving and kind? I think, I think you'd walk away and go, ah! never been with anyone like that. I mean, I think that's, that's surely true. Um, I, I think that you could say his, his wisdom. How many people think Jesus would be fine answering pretty much any question you'd have, right? He says, wisdom, the wisdom of Jesus Christ. But interestingly, John, 
Jesus' closest friend says, let me tell you what the glory was. I was with him for three years. The glory of Jesus was that he was full of grace and truth. Nothing he did with truth diminished his grace. And we do stuff with truth all the time that diminishes grace. True or false? But nothing that he did with truth diminished grace. And nothing he did with grace diminished truth. He was full of grace, and that's what I'm going for in my life. I'm going to spend the rest of my life on that point. We've talked about this before. That's the glory of Jesus, full of grace and full of truth. Verse 15, John bore witness about him, Jesus, and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Wow. That makes sense, right? Because normally, though, I can just tell you, we've been around, uh, we went out for dinner with Rick and Lynn on Friday night. It was, this is their April. They were kind to take us out. They're such loving people. And, and, and so Kathy and I had a good time with Rick and Lynn. And, and uh, April 1st is their uh, 23rd anniversary at our church. 23 years of faithfulness, right? Isn't that, isn't that incredible? And uh, the thing about it is, is, I mean, it didn't used to be like this, but now, 20-some years, that's one of the first things I find myself asking people when I meet them. How long have you been coming to Harvest? Because a lot of times I don't know, you know. And, and I love to hear a, a week, a month, a year. I love to hear that. Two years, three years, five years. But I've got to just tell you, there's something really cool when you talk to somebody like 10 years, eh, 15 years, coming for 20 years. <laughs> I like that. I hope, hope you get to there. I think there's something to be said for faithfulness. When... What John wants to make clear is, because remember, he comes before Jesus Christ. He is the guy who makes the way for Jesus, and we're going to see that in a minute. And what he wants to make really clear here is, just because I became before him, I'm not saying I have seniority. I'm not saying I have tenure. I understand how things work. People have been around a little longer, have a little more seniority, a little more tenure. How many people understand that? Okay, That's kind of the way things are. And he's saying, look, I just want to be crystal clear here. I got here first. (laughs) But this is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I have no seniority. That's what he's saying. Look at the verse. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me, (laughs) but not really after, ranks before me because he was before me. If you like to write stuff in your margin of your Bible, just write in there, eternal. Jesus Christ is eternal. We studied that last time. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All right. Now verse 16. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. That actually means continued waves of grace continually crashing upon the shores of our lives. That's grace. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. The law was do this or else. And it showed us failure, nothing more. Galatians 3.24 says that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. He said that's the program we were on. The law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See that there? Grace and truth is there again. I just want you to hear this. The power is in the combination. Do you understand that? So we're out at this dinner with Rick and Lynn. They take us actually for a steak. It was really, really good. And and, and, uh, how many people like steak? Okay, okay, but do you understand? I I try to be very helpful at church. Do you understand that a bite of good steak is good, but not nearly as good as a bite of good steak with some mashed potatoes on it? (laughs) True or false? And a bite of good steak with some mashed potatoes and a little bit of that creamy horseradish, get out of here. All right? Right now, uh, the power is in the combo. Do you understand? You don't get anything about eating if you don't get that the power's in the combo. It's the flavors going together, bro. I, you get helpful stuff here at Harvest. <laughs> a fun way of saying to you that the power in Jesus Christ is not the grace. The power is not the truth. Tell me, what's the power? It's, 
It's the grace and truth. The power's in the combination of the two. And how weak are we when we're just grace? And how weak are we when we're just truth? God help us to get the power in the combination. And that's why he says it here. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then he says, no one has seen God. We've taught on this before. We don't ever see, we won't ever see God the Father. Colossians 1 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1 says that he is the exact imprint of his nature, that he is the radiance of the glory of God. Get this, Jesus Christ is the only God you will ever see, all right? You're not going to gaze upon the Father. You're not, not going to see the Holy Spirit. There are three in one we're going to see in eternity, Jesus Christ. You're not going to see three gods walking around in heaven. I hope you understand that. Uh, three persons eternally existing in one, and what we will see, the only God who is at the Father's side, Jesus Christ, he has made him known. Do you recognize it? Here's the implications. The phrase that really stood out to me in this little paragraph was that grace upon grace. Do you see it there? Now, I just want to ask you this. Here's the application. Do you recognize, every person here, do you recognize that your life is a life of grace upon grace? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just encourage you for a moment. I don't do this normally, and I don't want you to think it's strange, but I'm going to, because the picture that came to my mind was waves, waves of grace. No matter what you're burdened about, no matter what you don't have yet, no matter what hasn't sorted itself out in your life, we are so graced. And I, keep, I kept picturing these waves as I was thinking about it. So. I'm going to just, I want you to close your eyes, and I just want to hear some waves here. And I want you just to think with me as you think about these waves. That the grace of God is washing over your life continually. Grace upon grace. Think about it. You have life. You have breath and health and strength, and it's a privilege. You have life. You have location. You live in the United States of America. The most impoverished among us is likely doing very well by world standards. We have so much. We lose sight of it. And to whom much is given, much is required. Do you live as one who recognizes the grace of life, the grace of location, and to say nothing of life and light, life and location? We have light. We have light. We have so much light. We have the Word of God. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most of the people listening to me right now could share the gospel, yet most of the people in America could not. Most of the people listening to me here know the comforting presence of God's Word and the fellowship of the saints. Most people here know the joy of lifting their voice in worship to a purpose that is so far beyond ourselves. We have received so much in Jesus Christ, life and location and light and love. You're in such a loving community of people. And if you're not experiencing it, don't stand out there. I want to meet the person who hasn't yet experienced the love in this family of God. Like you can't get this at the mall, all right? What God has entrusted to us is immense. Now look up here. Do you live like that, though? Do you live and think and act like a person who has grace upon grace upon grace in Jesus Christ, all that God has given us, amen? All right, God help us to live like that. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Here's the second thing. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Notice now as we begin, your Bible probably says something about John the Baptist starting in verse 19. John the Baptist appears publicly about 26 AD, four years before Jesus. And uh, I told you a little bit about him before, but let me just read you um, a wee bit more about him. Uh, John the Baptist, in Mark chapter 1, it says, 
that John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to John and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. That's John the Baptist. Okay, back to John chapter 1. Now here he comes, verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites, there's some debate about who these were, but for sure they were religious leaders that were sent out from Jerusalem to ask John, uh, who, who are you? I mean, it seems fairly easy to see why they were wondering that, right? Because people were flocking to him and he was wearing weird clothes and eating strange things, and he was baptizing people. Now, the religious leaders, they were like the ritual police, okay? Y'all don't have no right to be baptizing people, man. That's what we do. And so John broke with the religious tradition. In fact, he really is pretty confrontive of the Pharisees. Let me just read you something quick from Matthew chapter 3. But when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to John, he said to them, so, so they're like, well, we'll get baptized too. The religious leaders come out to get baptized. Here's what he said to them. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, I don't believe y'all are repentant. Let's, let's see if you are. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able to, from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Then he says, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. So, uh, John's popularity with the religious leaders. Tell me. <laughs> right? Not popular. Telling it like it is. And that little backdrop from the other Gospels helps us understand why they sent some people out to him in verse 19. And they're like, who are you? He, con he confessed, notice, verse 20. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the, what's the next word? Christ. What's the word Christ mean? Uh, it means, uh, literally it means anointed one, but the uh, Hebrew uh, word is actually translating uh, the idea of Messiah. Do you know that all through the 39 books of the Old Testament, a Messiah was promised? And because they studied it carefully, they knew someone special is coming, someone special is coming, someone special is coming, and they knew a lot about him. And things were not going good under the Roman occupation, so the uh, volume on we need the Messiah was kind of at a fever pitch. So John starts baptizing people. Everybody's flocking to him. He's, uh, he's pretty intense with the religious leaders, but they're like, we better find out who this guy is. So, uh, not, the, not the most subtle investigation. Are you the Christ? That's what they said to him. But notice, now, the, now hang on for a sec. That's kind of a tempting question, really. I mean, think of John for a minute. Man, the people are coming to me. The lines of people that want to be baptized. And, 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 and the, the, the interest in my preaching about repentance I'm not the Christ, but, you know, there could be something kind of Christ-like about me. Not, not at all. Not at all. It's so awesome to know who you are. Notice that he says, it's it, it kind of a three-peat there. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. Is it trying to make a point? How clear was John about the fact that he's not the Christ? Am I making, I'm not the Christ. Am I making myself clear? crystal, right? He's very clear about this. So, so then they're like, verse 21, they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? Now, Elijah was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Everybody learning? Learning? Learning in church? Elijah was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Do you know what the last book, do you know, do you know what the last verse in the last book of the Bible says? Do you know? Malachi 4, 5 says that the Messiah... Behold, I will send, this is the last verse in the Old Testament. They, this is kind of like the lights out. They've been waiting for this for 400 years. Last verse in the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So they, they thought that the prophet Elijah himself was going to come back 
before the Messiah. So they kind of weren't really watching for the Messiah. They were more watching for, tell me. So they think, well, maybe we missed Elijah. Are you the Christ? He's like, absolutely not. So then he's like, well, okay, well, then are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Now, what's really interesting about that is, is that Luke 1, 17, do you guys understand that John, it's kind of a long thing, but John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin? The Bible scholars believe that Mary and Elizabeth, they were cousins. And so Jesus and John the Baptist were like, oh, that make them like second cousins. And, and so what's really interesting is, is that um, in the text, um, when the angel announced to uh, Elizabeth and her husband that they were going to have a baby. Elizabeth was old. Mary was young, like you'd expect in cousins possibly. And um, Elizabeth had a baby in her old age. And the angel announced and said that he will have the spirit of, do you know, of Elijah. And so John the Baptist wasn't Elijah, but he had a ministry just like that, telling it like it is, living outside, laying it down, preaching repentance. So this is the person that the Old Testament prophesied. It's kind of amazing then to see as the text goes on. Look at verse 21 again. And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. You're like, well, James, didn't you just say (laughs) that he was? Correct. And if you want to read some more on that, um, you can read... um, uh, through many of the Gospels, actually, uh, that indicate that he did fulfill the prophecies about Elijah. Here's what's really amazing. He was the fulfillment of the prophecy, and he didn't know it. He didn't know. In fact, he didn't even, you're going to see in a minute, he didn't even know that Jesus was the Christ. This is all unfolding right now in real time. Looking back, we can see that's who he is. An angel in heaven who knows everything can pronounce it, but of course the scriptures weren't written down yet. He doesn't know. But is that really that much different than the way God works today? How often does God use our lives in ways that we don't have any idea and we start to get into problems when we, when we think we're more than we are. We're in a really good place when we can say like John, I'm not him, it's not about me. We're really in a good, are you Elijah? No, no, that couldn't possibly, I'm just as regular folk like you. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's how we should act. That's how we should act. I don't, I don't, we don't need no superstar celebrity, I think I'm something Christian's. And, and let me say, I'm very happy to be used, but if you're wondering, I hope we get a chance to talk so you can hear it from me, okay? N- none of us are anything. Christ is everything, okay? Amen? All right, so, under this heading then, let me finish this paragraph. And he answered, are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, well, who are you? <laughs> we need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Here's what he says. Okay, you want to know who I am? You want to know who I am? Here, this is me. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He's quoting from Isaiah 40, verse 3. So this guy wasn't some flunky, okay? He knew the Bible. And John the Baptist says, you want to know who I am? I'll tell you who I am. It's interesting. He didn't know that he was Elijah, but he knew that his mission was to prepare the way for the Messiah. He didn't even know who the Messiah was. But he knew that his job was to say, make straight the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming. And this this guy is really something. He's um, really something. But it's really awesome because he doesn't think he's really something. And I think that's where the power is. Notice. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had sent f- uh, from the Pharisees, they asked him, then why, if, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? So why, why are you doing this if you're, if you're not that person? By the way, if you just look at the text, I underline it in my Bible. You can't really pick up the intensity when they're going back and forth, you know what I'm saying? But let me just read to you what, the, what they said to him. Here's what they said. Who are you? What then, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor the prophet? This guy was humble because he didn't even get offended. John just says, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you 
Was Jesus in the crowd right then? Tomorrow he's going to get baptized. We'll see that in a minute. So he could have been right there. I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me. What do you think about Jesus, John? He says, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. Now the filthy feet from walking on the road, the the lowest job for a servant was to take someone's filthy-footed sandal off and, and to wash their feet. And he's like, the one who's coming, I'm not even good enough to, I'm, I'm not even good enough to wash his feet. We would say, I, I'm not even good enough to clean there. Tell me. I'm not even good enough to clean their toilet. That's what he's saying. I'm not, I'm not good enough for that. So let me just ask you, does he have a low view of himself or does he have a high view of Jesus? He's a high view of Jesus. He don't, don't, he's not like, oh, I'm awful, I'm the worst person in the world. Low self-esteem is not a fix, brothers and sisters. Christ esteem is the fix. Amen. It's not to self-deprecate, it's to Christ to elevate. Amen. Do you see the difference? Okay. So, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. All right, here's the second application. I am his unworthy messenger. I am his unworthy messenger. Do you understand that about yourself? That you're his unworthy messenger? That's all we are, nothing more. Look at, look at, you don't know who you are until you know who Jesus Christ is. Do you understand that? He's the reference point for everything. I've never told this uh, story in church before, but when I was uh, a little kid, I think it was like about eight years old or something, um, I took piano lessons. How many people took piano lessons? It wasn't that awful. And, <laughs> and I, I took piano lessons, but I took piano lessons from this girl named Ruth. I was eight, she was probably like 20 or 22 or something. And I had this like wide-eyed, mouth dropped open, crazy, insane crush on her. She she played the piano at our church on Sunday nights, and I didn't want to take piano lessons, but I sure wanted to learn the piano from her. (laughs) And she was such an encourager too, like nobody else was there getting lessons when I was there, so I'd go get piano lessons from her. I really thought, I started to think after a few months that I was like the best piano player in the world. Certainly her best student. So when she announced to me and to my parents that we were going to be having a piano recital, I mean, my first thought was, well, of course she wants to show me off to people. So um, the the song that I prepared uh, to sing uh, goes like this. This It's something. You're going to be pretty blown away by this. Here it is. Um, It's called... Uh, the ballerina. (laughs) All right, so, so, (laughs) I did not want to disappoint. So I practiced and practiced and practiced the little ballerina like hundreds of times and I got on my little bow tie and my shirt and we went over to her house and I was the youngest student. And then I had to sit there for like an hour and a half while the older students played Chopin, (laughs) Beethoven, Mozart. By the, by the time it was my turn, I, was, I think I must have been the last or the second last person, and I went up and put my little, remember those books, and I put my book up there. You know, I had it memorized, and I, and I started out. came over and put her hand on my shoulder and she was like, it's, it's okay. So I tried again. <laughs> and 
And I hung my, <laughs> I hung my head at the piano and I sobbed. Just, just broke down crying. They took me back to my seat. Thank you. <laughs> I can assure you I'm over it. But what was my problem? My problem was, was that I thought I was good because of the standard to which I was comparing myself. I hadn't heard anyone else play. I didn't know what other people could do. I was just existing in my own little world, congratulating myself on how much progress I had made. I was not good. I shouldn't have really probably been allowed to be in the recital. I for sure needed a reality check about where I was in relation to what piano playing is. Now the problem with a lot of Christians is, you answer if this is you, the problem with a lot of Christians is, is that we compare ourselves to other Christians instead of comparing ourselves to Jesus Christ the Lord. All right? And if we would just get our eyes on Him and see the standard and know John was articulate, talented, powerful, persuasive, brilliant, and massively humble because he had his eyes on the standard and he realized he had nothing to brag about, nothing to be uh, super inflated about. Jesus, Jesus said of John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11, Jesus said, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. How many people believe Jesus probably was correct? Okay, so better than Billy Graham, better than D.L. Moody, better than Charles Spurgeon, better than Corey Ten Boom. You just you start listing, better than Ruth, better than Esther. Best ever born John the Baptist. And about Jesus, he says, I'm not even worthy to take his sandals off. That's helpful to me. Who are you comparing yourself to? And if you allow yourself that congratulations because you're better than your neighbor or someone in your small group or someone in your row, if you're congratulating yourself because you're the better contributor to your marriage or you're the better parent in your home or the better employee in your office, when the real standard gets rolled out, you're going to hang your head and sob. Better to take the adjustment now. Jesus is the Christ. I am his unworthy messenger. Let's say that together. Jesus is the Christ. Tell me. That's who I am. Turn the page now, just these two. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. This is fantastic. The next day, the next day, we're going to be in uh, one week of time here till we get uh, through chapter 2. It's all happening real fast. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. I think you guys understand that... Um, John used that picture, it made a massive impact on them because they were all under the sacrificial system. They knew that sin causes separation and only blood sacrificed, only a death substituting can wash away sin, can provide forgiveness, can restore relationship. Remember Abraham? When Abraham was uh, taking Isaac up to be sacrificed and, and Isaac was like, where's the sacrifice? What did Abraham say? God will provide himself a lamb. And remember when, uh, the, we studied this a couple years ago, remember the blood on the doorposts at the Passover? Remember how they killed a lamb and put the blood over the doorposts so that when the angel of the Lord came over, he would see that a death had taken place to provide forgiveness? How great the river of blood that flowed through the Old Testament as the lambs, thousands, countless of them, were slaughtered and their blood was shed and sprinkled on the mercy seat as a prefigurement of Christ's atoning death for you and me. And those little lambs, right? Do you remember a couple years ago when we had a lamb in church? 
How many people were here that day? And I came out on the stage with the little lamb and, uh, and uh, remember I held the lamb like this and then I picked up this big butcher knife and everyone went freakazoid. <laughs> that was quite a night. And uh, we learned that lambs are weak and vulnerable, a picture of innocence and that they're pure and spotless, a picture of their preparedness to bear our sin. And so when John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, jot this down. Jesus is the Lamb of God. I am under his forgiveness. I am under his forgiveness. I am under his forgiveness. How great that is. How great that is. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, bringing forgiveness. Do you have that, by the way? Most of the people that pass you on the freeway do not. Most of the people where you work do not. Have you, has your eyes been open? Have your eyes been opened, your heart eyes, to see the glorious truth that's found in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? And have you embraced Him by faith for your forgiveness? Jot these five things down quickly. If you're truly forgiven by God, if you're truly forgiven by God, one, we're blessed, big time. That puts us in a very small minority through faith in Christ. Romans 2, 4 says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Secondly, if you're forgiven, you're without condemnation. You're blessed and you're without condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says you don't have to have false guilt. Some people, they live their life like this. They're going along and then every time something bad happens, they're like, God's trying to get me. God's trying to get me. That's so Catholic, okay? And I want you to, I want you to be free from that. I just want you to be free from that. That's not what the Bible says. Romans 8, 1 says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. All right? And I don't, I don't care what anybody says. I want to know what the Word of God says. And, and we don't need to live under a cloud of doubt. Oh, I lost my job this week. God's trying to get me. God loves you. All right? Jesus died for you. If you've come to Christ by faith and embraced him for your forgiveness, all of your sin is washed away. And you're to live a life of holiness as an expression of your gratitude to God. Amen. All right? And yes, the Lord chastens us. And yes, he allows us to go through difficult things to refine us. All right? But God is not condemning you. God is not judging you. If you're truly forgiven by God, you're blessed. You live without condemnation. You're tenderhearted. People who are truly forgiven are tender-hearted. Church should be a messy place because we're all just like weeping all over each other. And anybody here tender-hearted? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and evil speaking be put away from you and be kind one to another, Ephesians 4. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven. Point to who? Are you tender-hearted? That's the mark of a person who's forgiven, blessed, without condemnation, tenderhearted. Fourthly, we give grace to others. That's part of tenderheartedness. Colossians 3, 3 says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Forgiven people forgive. Forgiven people forgive. Jesus said, if you will not forgive your uh, brother, neither will God in heaven forgive you. Forgiven people forgive. Somebody needs to write that down. Somebody somewhere in this church, that's why you came this weekend. Get after that. Forgiven people forgive. And lastly, if you're forgiven, it is the most significant thing about you. You're forgiven. 1 John 2, 12 says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Amen. So I'm under his forgiveness. Here's the last one. Jesus is the Son of God. Let me just read this. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. God had told him that would be the sign. And it remained on him. I myself did not know him. John says, I didn't know who it was going to be. I, I didn't know. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend, that's the Holy Spirit, and remain. This is he who, I mean, that would be a little strange, right? I saw just a dove just... She's like watching the sky all the time. That, that could be him. 
That could be him, dove comes down, lands right on him. I'm fairly sure that's him. How many people here have ever had a dove land on them, just for a reference point? Okay, okay, so that would be fairly unusual, right? So if you see a dove land on the guy, you're like, that's him! I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain in the form of a dove. It's the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness, this is the Son of God. How awesome. So that's the last part. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Why didn't John recognize him? Isaiah 53 says that he had no form or majesty, that we should be drawn to him. He didn't have any beauty. It wasn't like you'd see Jesus and he'd like, bam, just stick out in the crowd. In his humanity, he was very regular. His miracles hadn't begun or his teaching. John didn't know him, but now he knows this is the Son of God. Jot this last application down. I have his spirit in me. I have his spirit in me. Jesus came to baptize his followers in the Holy Spirit. This is a really important sentence, even though it comes at the end of the message, so don't want to misunderstand this. Every Christian has all of the Holy Spirit, okay? 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, by one spirit were we all baptized into one body. Everyone say all. all. If you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will my heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? All right? If you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to learn a lot more about the Holy Spirit in the book of John. There's whole chapters dedicated to it. But the Holy Spirit came to live in every Christian to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit came to live within every one of us to comfort us, to guide us, to give us strength and wisdom. The Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. The Spirit of Jesus Christ lives within every child of God. Now, bow with me in a word of prayer. And with your heads bowed, I'm just gonna walk back through those before we sing. And I want you to pick one for yourself. I'm not thinking that all of those were for you, but I have been praying that one of those was why you came today. Maybe you need some greater gratitude in your life. Jesus is full of grace and truth, and I am graced to know him. Grace upon grace in my life. God, forgive me for my ungratefulness. I'm so blessed. I have so much. Forgive me, God, for not focusing on that. Is that the one for you? Or Jesus is the Christ and I am his unworthy messenger. Have you been puffed up, inflated, expecting more than you could rightly deserve, thinking too highly of yourself and too little of others and worst of all, too little of Christ? Or Jesus, the Lamb of God, You're forgiven. Maybe that's God's word for you. You're forgiven. God loves you. If you've never turned to Christ by faith, do it now and receive him. Ask him to come into your life. He'll forgive you. Or this last reminder, because Jesus is the son of God, I have his spirit in me. I have his spirit in me. I don't have to worry if I'm going to make it. With his help, I will make it. His spirit is with me and will never leave me or forsake me. His spirit goes with me as I leave today. Let's stand and sing and worship. Amen. Hey, it's so great to be into God's word this way, isn't it? And uh, next week, uh, God willing, uh, the disciples get called. And they hear those words for the first time. Follow me. Follow me. So I'll be studying that all week, whatever uh, you're you're gonna be doing. Let's pray for one another. In fact, we have uh, people up here and on all of our campuses right now that would love to pray with you, and uh, you are loved. Have a great week.